I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to give this talk. But I can't bring myself to do so because the assignment I was given was totally impossible. The invitation email said, would you be interested in giving the review one hour talk on the relation between math, physics, and strings? Now, the email I wish I had gotten would have said, would you be interested in giving the review five hour talk on the applications of six dimensional two zero theories to physical mathematics? Well, okay, after some negotiations, we agreed, okay, I'll give a one hour talk, but I'm going to make some heterodox choices. It's clear I have to make choices, even with this much, much narrower uh, subject matter that couldn't possibly fit into an hour. And my unusual heterodox choices are governed by the saying of baseball's master of enigmatic aphorism, Yogi Berra, who once said, nobody goes there anymore, it's too crowded. So I did write a one hour talk, and I did so with the help of many great physicists. And in particular, I'd like to thank Edward and Davida and Juan, Andy, Yuji, Nati, and Dan Freed. So our story begins in 1977 with Nam's theorem, which classifies superconformal algebras. The existence of these relies on special isomorphisms of Lie algebras, and they only exist in dimensions up to six. So these are called the zero K algebras, and here they are, and the uh, even subalgebra is the conformal algebra, and this is the R symmetry. Now there has been some work done on K bigger than two by Chris Hull and more recently by Lars Brink and Pierre Ramond and collaborators, but in this talk K is firmly going to be equal to two, so the R symmetry is USP4 SO5. The Poincaré subalgebra is standard, and then we can have so-called central terms related to the existence of BPS strings, and also central terms related to the existence of BPS codimension two objects, which will play a very important role later in the talk. Now, there's a free field multiplet here, uh, consisting of five real scalar fields, four chiral fermions, and a three-form H, which is closed and, crucially, is self-dual. And this theory can be generalized to a theory of many tensor multiplets where H is valued in a real vector space. Now, already these free theories are very subtle when put on arbitrary manifolds. So if you try and talk about the action principle, the partition function, the charge lattice and Dirac quantization, the Hilbert space and Hamiltonian formulation. Formulating all these things properly in arbitrary backgrounds is actually extremely subtle and even forces us to uh, generalize the standard notion of field theory. Here are some key papers on the subject, going back to Witten's foundational paper on the five brain partition function. In the past year, Sam Monier wrote a nice paper on the metric dependence of that partition function. Zyberg and Taylor discussed the Dirac quantization for these generalized abelian theories. And I also want to mention that these gentlemen here are also thinking about the partition function because it's important to their program of understanding quantum corrections to the hypermultiplet moduli spaces of type two compactifications on kalabi yaus But today, our focus is a little different. Our focus is more on the interacting theories. And the history of these goes back to a remarkably prescient paper of Witten's in which, among, among many other things, he studies the 2B theory on a hyperkähler ADE singularity in a certain decoupling limit. And in this decoupling limit, there are light strings. We try and decouple gravity, taking the Planck mass to infinity. And shortly thereafter, Strominger wrote a beautiful paper pointing out that open M2 brains can end on M5 brains. So when we have parallel M5 brains coming close together, 
we have light dynamical strings, and again, we can try and take a decoupling limit. Okay, so we get some kind of six-dimensional theory with light dynamical strings, and the question is, is it a field theory? This was first stressed by Zyberg, that it's actually a local quantum field theory, which is not obvious given the elephant in the room, which we're going to pretend is not there, and we're simply going to focus in this talk on the local quantum field theory. So, to summarize what I've said in section one of the talk, we conclude that there are free abelian theories. They are already non-trivial on general backgrounds, and then there are even more subtle interacting theories. I'll call them S of G for simply lace G, and we're going to try and learn about their dynamics. Now, in a proper presentation, I would then talk about some interesting developments by a number of mathematicians having to do with uh, what's called extended topological field theory, but we don't have time for that, so we're going to skip to describing the characteristic properties of these theories. So we're going to just skip this section. and talk about the properties of these six-dimensional theories. So I stress that they have not been constructed even by physicists' standards. And we're simply going to use string theory and M-theory to deduce their properties. I'll talk about three key properties and four ingredients. We will treat those properties as axiomatic, and we hope that someday they will be theorems. So the first thing to say is, what kind of theory is it? Well, it's a theory in six dimensions. And it also requires some other topological data, which I won't go into in detail. But even more, it is some, something like a generalization of the notion of field theory. And one way to approach that is the theory of singletons. And to, one way to say this is that it's a six-dimensional field theory valued in a seven-dimensional topological field theory. So what in the world does that mean? Well, that was the point of the section we just skipped. So I'm not going to uh, explain that, but I will say that the seven-dimensional field, topological field theory for SUN is just the uh, Chern-Simons uh, theory of level N. Okay, now why is it interacting? Because if you put this theory on a circle of radius R, then it becomes five-dimensional super Yang-Mills theory with coupling squared equals R. Moreover, these theories have moduli spaces of vacua on Minkowski space. So in general, that would be R5 times the Cartan subalgebra modulo the Weyl group. And that's particularly clear for the gauge algebra equals UN from the Strominger picture of N parallel five brains, because you see if they're separated, then we have at low energy one tensor multiplet on each of those parallel five brains. And then the space here is just the uh, moduli space for the vacuum expectation values of those scalar fields. Now, what are the ingredients? Well, there are, as I said, light dynamical strings which source the abelian tensor multiplets. More importantly for our story, there are surface defects. They're labeled by a representation R of the gauge algebra and a surface, and at smooth points on the moduli space at long distances, you could think of that as a sum over the weights in the representation of the holonomies of the B field. There are also chiral operators, which we'll have to skip, unfortunately. But I do want to focus on these codimension two defects. So there are codimension two defects which preserve half the supersymmetry. And there's an important class of them. I'll call that D rho M. And they're parametrized by rho, which is a homomorphism from SL2 into the complexification of the Lie algebra, and M, which is in the centralizer of the image of rho. So how do we think about these defects, D of rho M? A good way to think about it is to think about compactification on a circle and how they behave upon compactification on a circle. So one thing you can do is you can compactify on a longitudinal circle, by which I mean the defect actually wraps the circle. So if you do that, then you get down to five-dimensional super Yang mills coupled to a codimension two defect. Now a codimension two defect is a three-dimensional object in five-dimensional Yang mills. Five-dimensional Yang mills is weakly coupled in the infrared. 
And therefore, we are coupling to some superconformal field theory, and the statement is that it is the theory called T rho of G by Gaiato and Witten. I'll explain a little more about that. You can also compactify on a cigar, as was done in Edward Witten's talk yesterday. So here's a cigar, and you put the defect at the end, and then you reduce along the rotational symmetry around the cigar, and you get a five-dimensional theory on a manifold with boundary. And so you have to put boundary conditions, and among the boundary conditions, you put boundary conditions on the five scalars of super Young mills. So here you have, for three of the scalars, what's called a non-pole singularity. So the little ti are standard generators of SL2. And rho of ti is therefore sitting in our Lie algebra, and we have these non-poles. And then the other two scalars are commuting with these xi's. Now these are two different ways of looking at the defects, and it's rather beautiful how they fit together with S-duality. So you see, you could first compactify on the cigar and then down on the longitudinal circle, and you get four-dimensional super Yang mills with a non-pole singularity, the three of the scalars. You could also compactify on the longitudinal circle first, get five, and then on the cigar, and then you get four-dimensional super Yang mills coupled to this superconformal field theory. And indeed, as a special case of the theory of S-duality of boundary conditions that Gaiato and Witten worked out three years ago. Indeed, these are S-dual boundary conditions. Now, there's a whole taxonomy of these defects which we don't have time for, but there's one point that I want to stress, and that is we can always take rho equals zero. It's called a full defect, and the reason is that these defects have global symmetries. It's just G if our gauge group is G. And um, in general, if rho is non-trivial, that breaks some of the global symmetry. But if rho is zero, then the global symmetry is the full group, so in this example, SUN. OK. Now, in this subject of physical mathematics, there are a large number of remarkable correspondences between A and B, where A and B are two subjects which were formerly thought to be unconnected. And Many of these kinds of correspondences can be understood by compactifying in two different ways and comparing. So there's a host of 2D, 4D correspondences based on 6 equals 4 plus 2. Uh, in some sense, Nakajima's early work fits in that. In some sense, uh, the formulation of geometric Langlands by Kapustin and Witten fits in that. Certainly, the Aldai Gayata Tachikawa correspondence, which relates Nakrasov partition functions, four-dimensional partition functions with conformal blocks of 2D, conformal field theory, is an example of that. In work I did with David Gaiato and Andy Knightsky, henceforth referred to as GMN, uh, we found some 2D, 4D correspondences. You can also understand some of the program of Nakrasov and Shadashvili relating 2D integrable models to 4D super Young mills in these terms, and Chikati, Knightsky, and Vafa also have a 2D, 4D correspondence, which I'll talk about more later. Now, you can also write 6 equals 3 plus 3, and that gets you into the world of duality domain walls, and they lead to three-dimensional compactifications of these theories, which are then related to three-dimensional non-compact Chern-Simons theories. These go back, here are some of the authors in this subject, this is a subject which is picking up steam and becoming quite hot right at this moment. So now we come to the core of this talk, which is the theories of class S. So the way we define these is we consider a 2-0 theory, S of G, and I remind you that it has co-dimension 2 defects, D. And so now we take a Riemann surface C with punctures. So it has genus G with N punctures, and we put these defects, dA, at punctures zA. Okay? Now, we want to preserve four-dimensional n equals 2 supersymmetry, so we break the R symmetry to SO3 plus SO2, and we partially twist by identifying the SO2 with the structure group of the Riemann surface C. If you can take the four-dimensional limit here, 
the low energy limit, then you get a four-dimensional theory, which I'll call S of G, C, D. Those are theories of class S. The S is for six. This uh, construction goes back to Witten's paper in 97, where he got N equals two theories from the M theory five brain. Some of these extra details were provided by GMN, and then Davide Gaiato went on to write a beautiful paper about S-duality and factorization, which I'll soon be talking about. There's also an entirely different point of view. There's a type two dual point of view, uh, having to do with geometric engineering, going back at least to Clem, Lerke, Meyer, Waffe, and Warner. Okay, now, these are old constructions, therefore, but in the past two years, there's been a great deal of effort, and uh, lots of interesting results have been derived for these theories. So what am I going to tell you about in limited time? It's like a kid being on a trip to the zoo. I mean, there's so many great exhibits to see. So which ones are we going to see? Uh, well, we can't see them all, right? So here's our trip to the zoo. We're going to talk about S-duality. We'll talk a little bit about the Higgs branches, a little more about the Coulomb branches and Higgin moduli. I'll talk about BPS states and wall crossing and their relation to line and surface defects. Then I'll say very briefly a few words about hyperkähler geometry, cluster algebras, holographic duals, and n equals four scattering. And sorry, there just isn't enough time to talk about really important subjects like omega backgrounds and Nekrasov partition functions, how that's related to AGT, which relates those to conformal blocks of Louisville and Toda theory. Then uh, Nadia Zyberg yesterday gave a beautiful talk, uh, including a uh, discussion of the superconformal index. And in the hands of Rastelli et al., uh, those have been computed for these theories of class S, and they're beautiful results and related to Q-deformed two-dimensional Yang-Mills theory. Uh, Yuji Tachikawa has done some very nice work on automorphism of G-twists of these theories and uh, defining a kind of S-duality for five-dimensional super Yang-Mills. And then, as I already said, there are relations to quantum integrable models from Nekrasov and Shadashvili and domain walls and Chern-Simons theory. Now, a guiding principle on our trip to the zoo is going to be that what we're dealing with here is a kind of generalization of conformal field theory, by which I mean the following. Because of this twisting, this theory, this four-dimensional theory, only depends on the conformal structure of C. Okay, so I told a little lie. For some Cs and Ds, it's difficult to take the four-dimensional limit to go from six to four dimensions, but putting those subtleties aside, what we have here is what you might call a conformal field theory valued in four-dimensional n equals two theories. Now from AGT, we know that the intuition here should be not rational conformal field theories like the vesemino witten model, but more like non-rational uh, conformal field theories like Louisville and um, Toto. Nevertheless, it's true that the space of coupling constants can be identified with the moduli space of genus G curves with n punctures. And so it's interesting to go to the boundaries of these moduli spaces. So that leads to what I call the Gaiato gluing conjecture. And the slogan here is that gauging equals gluing, by which I mean the following. Take two Riemann surfaces, C left and C right, and suppose they have defects D left and D right, and now let's suppose that there are two punctures which are full punctures, one on the left and one on the right, so they have the full, full global symmetry G. So now what we can do is we can gauge the diagonal G symmetry with coupling constant tau, and let's simply call the resulting four-dimensional theory uh, S left times S right. Now on the other hand, given these two surfaces, we can glue them together so we choose coordinates z left and z right around the punctures and use the standard plumbing fixture and produce a glued surface c left times c right. And Gaiato's statement is that s of this glued surface is the gauged version of s left times s right. Now again, because I told a little lie before, there are also situations where one gauge is just a subgroup. Personally, I feel the physics could be better understood here. That's probably my own inadequacy. Uh, 
Davide in his original paper already pointed out this kind of subtlety, but it has reappeared in subsequent work. For example, in Chakotana and Disley. Okay, so now using this, we can talk a little bit about S-duality. And so the first thing we can do is we can cut C into pants or three-hold spheres or trinians. And uh, once we do that, we get a presentation of this four-dimensional theory as a gauging of the theories associated to the trinians. So that's a way of presenting these theories. Now, these trivalent graphs label asymptotic regions of Teichmuller space, and they correspond to weak coupling regions. On the other hand, you can have two different regions of Teichmuller space which project to the same point in moduli space, and the theory is only parameterized by moduli space, so that means you have two different presentations of the same theory. And when you have two different presentations of the same theory, that's called a duality, and so this is S-duality in this context. Now, more generally, in conformal field theory, it was known from the old days of rational conformal field theory, that it's useful to introduce something called the duality groupoid, where you, the objects are the embedded trivalent graphs, and the morphisms are generated by braiding, fusing, and S-moves. And in this context, there's an S-duality groupoid, which was skillfully applied to the ADT correspondence by two groups. OK, now let's talk about um, those Trinian theories a little bit. So for simplicity, I'll just consider the case of three full functions in group SUN. And then we have, for n equals 2, three hypermultiplets. For n equals 3, we already have the E6 superconformal field theory of Minahan and Nemeschansky. And moreover, this observation allows you to give a geometrical description of arger zyberg duality together with a generalization to SUN. Okay, so now let's talk about the moduli space of vacua. So on general principles, there's a Coulomb and a Higgs branch. It's a special Kähler times a hyperkähler manifold. More generally, we have to take pieces like that and glue them together in complicated ways. Let me say a few brief words about the Higgs branch. Higgs branches of theories with Lagrangian presentations are just linear hyperkähler quotients. But Higgs branches of the non-Lagrangian Trinian theories are unknown and interesting and the subject of a no number of nice papers here. And I recommend a very nice talk by Yuji Tachikawa at the Strings math meeting at Penn a few weeks ago, and uh, Yuji and I wrote a little paper which summarizes in a uh, tight mathematical formalism uh, some of the results that come out of these, this work here. My main focus here is rather going to be on the Coulomb branch. And a good way to think about the Coulomb branch geometry is to think about the compactification of this four-dimensional theory to three dimensions on a circle. So if you compactify to three dimensions on a circle, then at low energies, you get a three-dimensional sigma model with a hyperkähler target space. And that is a torus vibration over the Coulomb branch. I'm calling B the Coulomb branch here. So over a point U in the Coulomb branch, uh, U is a point on the Coulomb branch, we have a torus. And those are compact scalars. And they come from the Wilson lines of the abelian gauge fields around the circle we compactified on together with the scalars which are dual to the three-dimensional fields. OK, now this should remind you of integrable systems. And indeed, the relation to integrable systems is as old, almost as old as zyberg witten theory itself. And the question is, which one? So here's where those theories of class S are very nice. In the theories of class S, we can say that it's related to the Hitchin system by the following simple argument. By definition, the four-dimensional theory is obtained by compactifying the six-dimensional theory on C. As I just said, we can compactify that on a circle and get a three-dimensional sigma model. Now let's do it the other way around. If we compactify on S1, we get five-dimensional super Yang mills, and then we could compactify on C and get the same theory. But you see, what have we gained here? This six-dimensional theory is some mysterious quantum theory of non-abelian gerbs, whatever that might mean. We don't know. But when we're in the world of Yang-Mills theory, 
then we have connections in scalar fields, and we can sure as hell write down differential equations. Right? So the BPS equations now are going to look like this. We have a field strength, and we have a scalar field. Phi here is uh, x4 plus ix5. Because of the twisting, it's a one form. And these equations here are known as Hitchens equations. And so we can identify m here as the moduli space of solutions to Hitchens equations on C. <coughs> well, I should say something about the boundary conditions. And that brings us back to those boundary conditions for defects. So what we have at the punctures are defects, and they lead to simple poles in the Higgs field. And the nature of the defect is encoded in the residue of, uh, of, the residue of that pole. But from the point of view of Hitchin theory, it's clear that there are also uh, irregular singular punctures. And I think that the defects in six dimensions corresponding to these are even more mysterious than the others. And so here's a gap in our knowledge. Now, what about the zyberg witten curve for these theories of class S? As far as I know, given an arbitrary n equals 2 theory, there's no algorithm for writing down the zyberg witten curve. But for theories of class S, it's very easy to write down the zyberg witten curve. We start with C, which I will now call the ultraviolet curve. We take its cotangent bundle, and that has a canonical one form PDQ on it. Then we can simply write down this equation, determinant of lambda minus phi equals 0. That defines a Riemann surface sigma. And you can show that that is the zyberg witten curve. And moreover, if you restrict lambda to that <coughs> curve, then you get the zyberg witten differential. So for example, for g equals sun, we can expand out the determinant. We get something like this. And that means that we have a branched covering, sigma, the infrared zyberg witten curve, over c, the ultraviolet curve. It's an n-fold branched cover. And that branch cover is going to be important for what I'm going to be saying next. So that's what I, I want you to think. I want you to think that up the cover is about the infrared. The base is about the ultraviolet. OK. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about BPS states. So first, a few general remarks just to set notation. If we're on the Coulomb branch, then there's a lattice of gauge and flavor charges. There's also a central charge function from gamma to C. We can decompose the one particle Hilbert space in electromagnetic charge sectors. And there's a Baga multi bound in each charge sector. And BPS states, by definition, saturate that bound. It turns out to be interesting to count BPS states. And the way you count BPS states is you write an index, trace minus 1 to the f. In fact, you can do better. You can write what's called the refined index, or the protected spin character, where you put in a coupling y here, which keeps track of some of the spin degrees of freedom. And this is still an index. So an index is piecewise constant as a function of parameters, like u on the uh, Coulomb branch. But nevertheless, even though it's an index, it can jump, and that's called wall crossing. And it jumps across walls of marginal stability. These are labeled by two electromagnetic charges, which are, uh, and the walls are the places where the central charges are parallel complex numbers. The essential physics is that BPS states can form BPS bound states. Now, already back in 1992, Chikati and Vafa wrote quantitative formulae for how the BPS indices of 2D BPS solitons jump across such walls. In 2007, several groups started writing down quantitative formulae for how the 4D BPS indices jump. And the most complete and conceptually simple formulation is the kontsevich seubelman wall crossing formula. But I'm going to show you that the halo configurations of Frederick Deneff capture the essential physics. Now, there are two nice recent developments in this subject. Manscott, Pielin, and Sen wrote two papers where they applied localization techniques to the moduli space of Deneff's multi-centered solutions and produced a new version of the wall crossing formula. And there's a nice review by Boris Pielin that compares the different forms of the wall crossing formula and the state of the art as to how uh, far we know that they're equivalent. So now that was about BPS states in general. 
what about theories of class S? Well, again, these theories are very geometrical. So there's a very beautiful geometrical formulation of these. That's because the BPS states come from finite open M2 brains, which end on the infrared Zybergwitten curve. And that leads to a nice picture having to do with string networks. Unfortunately, no time to describe that. But let me just say that combining wall crossing techniques with these string networks and with the relation to line and surface defects, you can get an algorithm for determining the BPS spectrum in all these theories of class S. With that motivation, let's now turn to line defects and surface defects. First, let's talk about line defects. And let's talk about line defects first in general and then specialize to theories of class S. So our line defects are going to be defects which sit at a point. So it's a defect at a point in space. And then it's going to stretch in the time direction, be it Euclidean or Lorentzian. We'll say a line defect is of type zeta if it preserves a certain supersymmetry algebra generated by q plus zeta q bar. As an example, you could take the supersymmetric Wilson loop, where you add the vector multiplet scalar with phase zeta like that. In general, if you have a line defect, it modifies the Hilbert space in the Hamiltonian. So we'll denote that modified Hilbert space by H sub L. It still admits a decomposition in terms of electromagnetic charges. And the new point is that in the charge sectors, the Bagamaldi bound is modified. This is the new Bagamaldi bound. And by definition, framed BPS states are states which saturate that new Bagamaldi bound. Now, framed BPS states have framed BPS indices, much like the ordinary BPS states did. And so we denote it with a framing on omega. And it depends on a lot of things. It depends on what line defect we're talking about. It depends on the charge sector. It's a spin character as a function of y. And crucially, it depends on zeta, the type of supersymmetry we preserved, and on u, the point where we are in the Coulomb branch. Now, as functions of zeta and u, it's piecewise constant. But once again, framed BPS indices also jump. They jump across what are called BPS walls, which are functions of a single electromagnetic charge. Don't worry too much about the definition. The physics of this BPS wall is the following. When you're near one of these walls, what happens is particles of this charge gamma can bind to the line defect. And so you get a picture very similar to Deneff's picture of halos. So you have this, this heavy. Uh, defect at a point in space, and BPS particles of charge gamma can bind to it in a BPS way. And you can calculate the bound state radius. And as you cross this wall, the bound state radius goes to infinity. In fact, you get whole Hilbert spaces of BPS particles in the halo here. And using that physical picture, you can write down a, a wall crossing formula, a mathematical wall crossing formula for the framed BPS indices. The way you do that is you introduce a generating function for these, summing over the charge sectors with x gamma as some bookkeeping devices. It turns out to be convenient to make them satisfy a Heisenberg algebra. And then the formula is that across this BPS wall for charge gamma h, where h is for halo, the generating function jumps from f minus to f plus by conjugating by a function of this x gamma h. That just follows from the combinatorics of free boson and free fermion Fox spaces. Now, what is this phi gamma of h? Well, phi of x gamma h. It's, uh, it's some complicated product of quantum dilogarithms. The important thing is that what particular product it is depends only on the unframed BPS index of gamma h. And therefore, you can derive the KS formula for the unframed indices by studying the framed indices. So consistency of the wall crossing of the framed BPS states implies the KS wall crossing formula for the unframed BPS states. And the way that goes is you look at two points, u1, zeta1, u2, zeta2. 
and two paths between these points. Now, as you go along one path, you might cross some set of BPS walls, of, yeah, of BPS walls. And across another path, you cross another set of BPS walls. The net result has to be the same, and therefore you have identities like this. The phi's depend on the unframed BPS indices, and therefore you get a formula for those called the KS formula. This is a point of view developed by GMN, and then it was applied by Andreas, Deneff, and Jefferis to supergravity. Meanwhile, Demofti, Gukov, and Soibelman clar clarified the relation of the motivic in the motivic KS wall crossing formula to the refined BPS index, the spin degree of freedom. And there were parallel developments by Chikati and Vafa and Chikati, Naitsky and Vafa. They instead used topological strings and non-compact kalabi yaus And two nice ideas that come out of their work is, if you know the KS formula, you know that there's a product which is ordered by the argument of the phases of the central charge. And that comes out very naturally because they consider an R symmetry generator as a Hamiltonian. And another thing is they relate things to um, chern simons theory. And that Heisenberg algebra for the X gammas that I flashed before comes out as the algebra of Wilson loop operators in a chern simons theory. So that was all about line defects and frame PPS states in general. Now, what happens in theories of class S? Well, I remind you that the six-dimensional theory has supersymmetric surface defects labeled by a surface sigma. So we can make a line defect out of a surface defect by wrapping one leg around a closed curve. Yes? So here's the ultraviolet curve, C. So take this yellow closed curve, call it P, wrap one leg around it, and you get a line defect in four dimensions. So we get a line defect then labeled by the closed curve P. It depends only on the isotopy class. And for G equals SU2, in a beautiful paper of Drucker, Morrison, and Akuda, they showed that the classification of these isotopy classes of closed curves on C, called the Dane-Thurston classification, matches perfectly with the classification of Wilson and Tuft operators in the theory S. The generalization of the Drucker, Morrison, Akuda result to higher rank has not been done. Another gap in our knowledge. OK. Now let's talk about surface defects. First, in general, our surface defect is going to stretch along the x3 axis, OK, in space. So it's a line in space. And then it stretches along the time direction to become two-dimensional. OK? Now, I should be giving you a UV definition and then an IR description. All I'll say about the UV definition is that it preserves two-dimensional 2, 2, two supersymmetry so you can think of that as the 2 comma 2 supersymmetry on the 1 plus 1 dimensional world volume of the surface defect. And if you decompose the 4 dimensional vector multiplet under that subalgebra, there's a distinguished twisted chiral supermultiplet, upsilon, whose lowest component is the vector multiplet scalar. How do we describe this coupled 2D 4D system in the infrared? Well, as far as the 4D system, we know from Zyberg and Witten that we should just take an effective prepotential that describes the infrared physics. Now, because we have a coupled 2D 4D system, we should then search for a twisted chiral superpotential, W effective. OK, now let's turn to theories of class S, sur surface defects and theories of class S. There's a canonical surface defect associated with a point on the ultraviolet curve. It can be obtained by taking an infinite open M2 brain, which ends on the x3 axis in four dimensions, and at a point z on the ultraviolet curve. Now, that's an ultraviolet definition. How do we think about it in the infrared? Well, as I've stressed, in the ultraviolet, we have n M5 brains wrapping the UV curve C. In the infrared, we have a single M5 brain wrapping the infrared zyberg witten curve covering C. So it stands to reason that the different infrared vacua for this M2 brain are the points in the fiber over, C, over Z. And moreover, that means 
that the chiral ring of this theory should just be the same equation for the zyberg witten curve. So let's see how this works in the case of SU2 with no flavors. So here is the zyberg witten curve of SU2 in spectral curve form. Make a tiny change of variables and you get this equation. Now how do we look at this equation? Well, if we just look at this term here, you recognize the chiral ring of the CP1 sigma model. And indeed, this canonical surface defect can be thought of as taking the CP1 sigma model, it has SU2 flavor symmetry, and you gauge it with the four-dimensional gauge fields. The presence of the vector multiplet scalar leads to a twisted mass, and according to Gaiato's paper, which I'm now reviewing, there's got to be a third term here, which we would like to attribute to 2D, 4D instanton effects. I think it would be nice if somebody gave an a priori instanton calculation that showed that this term is really there, another gap. Now, you can go on and talk about the superpotential, the effective twisted superpotential here. So here is Z defining our surface defect. Here are the vacua of that surface defect, the points in the zyberg witten curve. And Gaiato shows that the difference of the superpotentials at xi and xj is the integral of the zyberg witten differential over an open, open curve, gamma ij. It's an open curve on sigma that goes from xi to xj. Now, this clearly only depends on the homology class of the curve, but still this should trouble you because, look, there are infinitely many homology classes, right? Well, so that's true. So what's the physics of these choices of a, of a homology class, gamma ij? One way to think about it is in terms of the new BPS states in these coupled 2D, 4D systems. So if we were just doing the 1 plus 1 dimensional theory with 2 comma 2 supersymmetry, then we would have solitons, BPS solitons interpolating between i and j. Okay? But in the present uh, theory, the coupled 2D, 4D system, they carry electromagnetic charge and source the four-dimensional gauge theory. And so that's how we should think of this gamma ij. These are charges for the four-dimensional theory. A novelty is that we can now have non-trivial BPS states that interpolate between vacuum I and I because they carry non-zero charge. Okay. So now let's put together the surface defects and the line defects. If you have a line defect, you can put it inside the surface defect and make a domain wall. Okay? More generally, you can have an interface, I'll again call it L, between one surface defect S and another surface defect S prime. Okay, so we give it some ultraviolet definition, and then how do we describe it in the infrared? In the infrared, we would have a solenoid with some vacuum I, another solenoid with some vacuum J prime. J prime is a vacuum for S prime. And they would be joined by a dion, which again would source the gauge fields in the four dimensions. So there'll be some generalization of gamma Ij, which we'll call gamma Ij prime. Let's see how this works in theories of class S, where everything's nice and geometrical. So two surface defects are two points, Z and Z prime, on the ultraviolet curve. What's a supersymmetric interface? A supersymmetric interface is an open curve on the ultraviolet curve C, this yellow open curve that extends between Z and Z prime. So again, I call it P, and it gives me a supersymmetric interface. Now, in the infrared, we're going to have framed BPS states because we now have an interface, a line defect. The framed BPS states, again, are going to be, uh, have charges given by open paths, gamma ij prime, on the zyberg witten curve with endpoints over z and z prime. And so, again, we're going to have a relative homology lattice as our lattice of charges. Now, just as before, we can take the consistency of the wall crossing of these framed BPS states that leads to a generalization of the KS wall crossing formula for the unframed BPS indices, which we call the 2D, 4D wall crossing formula. Moreover, you can now also study wall crossing as a function of Z and Z prime. And when you do so, 
you make contact with at least one aspect of the paper of Gaiato and Wittens from last, last week, as well as with old work of Hori, Iqbal, and Vafa. And moreover, this studying the framed BPS states as a function of z gives you a is part of the tools that you can use to get an algorithm for computing the BPS spectrum of these theories of class S, as I alluded to before. OK. So now I want to say a few words about hypercalar geometry of the Coulomb branch. So let me remind you that when we talked about the Coulomb branch, I said it was good to think about the three-dimensional compactification. So, in the three-dimensional compactification, we had a target space, which I called the zyberg witten moduli space, the total space of this integrable system. In three dimensions, a vacuum is a point, little m, in that space. And now we can take our line defect, say for a closed curve p, and we can wrap it around the circle that we compactified on, and we get a local operator in the three-dimensional sigma model. That local operator has a vacuum expectation value in vacuum, little m. That's the left-hand side here. Now, what I'm saying in this equation is that there exists a nice set of functions, which I call y gamma of m, so that I can write these vacuum expectation values for all the line defects as a linear combination of these functions y gamma of m with coefficients, which are these framed BPS indices. These functions are very nice. This y gamma define a system of holomorphic Darboux coordinates for the zyberg witten moduli space. They can be constructed from a TBA-like integral equation. And from these coordinates, we can construct the hypercalar metric on M. And indeed, this construction was confirmed at the one instanton level by two nice papers by Chen, Dory, and Petunin. And those are impressive calculations, but you're never satisfied. So, you have to ask, then, what about the multi-instanton uh, contributions? Another gap in our knowledge. Now, these functions, y gamma, turn out to be related to what are called fock goncharov coordinates, not only for SU2 here, but in fact in general. But uh, for SU2, these y gammas appeared in the work of Fock and Goncharov on their, uh, on their work on quantum Teichmuller theory. And if we now generalize this to supersymmetric interfaces, where P is now an open path on the Zyberg, on, excuse me, bad mistake, where P is an open path on the ultraviolet curve, we again can form a supersymmetric interface. We can again get a local operator in the three-dimensional sigma model and take its VEV. It has, an ex, it has an expansion in terms of a generalization of the Y gammas. These are now sections of a bundle over M. And just the way you could construct the hypercalar metric from the y gammas, you can now construct what's called a hyperholomorphic connection on this bundle, or a BBB brain, from the, these generalized y gamma ij prime. What's a hyperholomorphic connection? Well, if you're on a hypercalar manifold, a connection is hyperholomorphic if it's of type 1, 1 in all complex structures. OK, so now let's say a few brief words about the geography of n equals 2, d equals 4 theories. Now, this has been stressed in uh, recent papers and talks by Chikati and Vafa. Given all this, all this work on progress on these theories of class S, it might be a fruitful time to address the question of classification. So what can we say? Well, many theories are simply classified by a gauge group and a representation. If you give a gauge group and a representation, you write down a Lagrangian, you're done, almost. And um, on the other hand, infinitely many Lagrangian theories are class S. Indeed, all the obvious theories that you would write down, like SUN with NF less than or equal to 2N, those are all class S. But infinitely many class S theories are not Lagrangian like the Trinian theories. Moreover, some Lagrangian theories appear to be outside class S. Here's an example. And finally, <clears throat> many n equals 2 theories can be geometrically engineered by considering type 2 theories on non-compact Calabi-Yaws with singularities, geometric engineering. So again, to draw on the wisdom of Yogi Berra, 
You gotta be careful if you don't know where you're going, otherwise you might not get there. Nevertheless, some people have been trying to think about approaches to classification. So there's a fast developing mathematical subject called the subject of cluster algebras and cluster varieties, which is closely related to the work of Fock and Goncharov, and it can be usefully applied to the study of class S theories. And indeed, Chikati, Knightsky, and Vafa suggested a classification via a 2D 4D correspondence which goes as follows. You engineer the four-dimensional theory using a non-compact Calabi Young. Then you study the world sheet of the fundamental string moving in that non-compact Calabi L, and you factor out alluvial mode, and you're left with a 2D, 2D, 2 comma 2 massive quantum field theory. And then Tricotti and Vav had an old program from the early 90s to classify these kinds of two-dimensional 2 comma 2 theories. So the idea is to use this 2D 4D correspondence to map the classification of 4D theories to this old classification or classification program of 2D theories. And in their recent paper, Chikati and Vafa then combined the 2D 4D correspondence with mathematical results on cluster algebras to classify a subset, which we heard about from Sergio Chikati, of complete n equals 2 theories. And the resulting list is very interesting. It's, in some sense, mostly of class S, but has exceptional cases which appear to be outside class S. So Chikati's talk mentioned quivers all over the place, but as you'll see if you look at their paper, it's also about cluster algebras. Now, Gaiato has a different way to approach this subject. He says, let's instead try to classify a pair of a theory and a surface defect. This is in the paper on surface defects I was reviewing before. And what he does in that paper is he constructs from a surface defect a certain geometry, which is like this geometry of sigma covering C. And it has equations like Hitchin equations. Maybe that geometry is the invariant we should be classifying. And it seems like a good way to go, because any reasonable theory should have surface defects but I think it's clear that there's a lot more to do and to fill in some gaps here. Now, the situation's a little better at large n, because large n limits with m-theory duals are described by the bubbling geometries of Lin, Lunin, and Maldicena. And indeed, Gaiato and Maldicena showed that large n class S theories with regular singularities, with regular punctures, do fit into the bubbling geometry scheme, but a true classification would require a classification of uh, good boundary conditions for the 3D Toda equation. In particular, we don't know the large N description of the superconformal class S theories corresponding to Arger's Douglas theories. Those are class S theories with irregular punctures. And then there can be large N limits with type 2B duals, which don't lift to M theory. Another gap in our knowledge. Time to look at some, to acknowledge the egregious submissions that I've made. So the first of these is applications to strong coupling scattering in n equals 4. So it turns out that for a particular Arger's Douglas theory of class S, these functions y gamma, which appeared in the construction of the hyperkähler geometry of the zyberg witten moduli space, these are just the cross ratios which solve the aldi maldicena minimal area problem in ADS. And that has led to a lot of technology transfer about TBAs and Y systems and the calculus of small flat sections. And there's a long list of papers. Only some of them are listed here. And given what we heard yesterday, especially in Anastasia Svelovich's talk, it's clear that there's going to be future technology transfer. Now, another omission, uh, the AGT correspondence, which relates the Nekrasov partition functions to conformal blocks. Well, we heard a little bit about that from Alexei Morozov's talk yesterday. And if you want to learn more, there was a really nice workshop at the KITP in, last summer, 2010. And there are a lot of excellent review talks online at that workshop. 
So that, that workshop was largely devoted to explaining the AGT correspondence. And then there's been the work of Witten, where he combines work on the analytic continuation of chern simons theories with these class S theories to obtain a new gauge-theoretic, Morse-theoretic approach to the categorification of not polynomials. And then there's the program of Nekrasov and Shadashvili relating two-dimensional quantum integrability and the uh, eigenstates of the 2D uh, quantum integrable models with the vacua of four-dimensional super Young Mills. And again, these um, egregious omissions can be made up by looking at some good workshops online. So there's a series of Simon Center workshops, and in particular, the last one in March has some good talks reviewing Nekrasov Shadashvili and also uh, Witten's approach to the categorification of not polynomials. And there will be a KITP workshop this summer, which presumably will have some good talks uh, summarizing the Nekrasov Shadashvili program. But there's one omission that I cannot omit. And that is the work that some people have done on trying to address this crucial question of how do we construct these theories of class S. Well, there's not a whole lot. Uh, one attempt, going back to a paper of Aharoni, Berkus, and Zyberg, is to use ideas of matrix theory and discrete light cone quantization. And they came up with a formulation of the theory in terms of supersymmetric quantum mechanics on instanton moduli spaces. And I think that's a nice approach and should be developed further. More recently, Lambert and Papagayergakis uh, tried to generalize the supersymmetry transformations of the abelian tensor multiplet to a non-abelian version. So the idea there essentially was to imitate the spectacular success for non-abelian M2 brains of Lambert and Bagger and of Gustafsson, and they were partially successful. Then Lambert et al. and independently Douglas uh, wrote some papers last year trying essentially to define the theory by flowing up the renormalization group from 5D super Yang mills, essentially by guessing at a UV completion, essentially guessing that the instanton particles is all we need to add. So these are interesting papers. This is a very important subject, but I think it's fair to say that there's more than a gap. There's a chasm in our understanding of this subject. Okay, it's time to summarize and look ahead. As to looking ahead, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. As to summarizing, well, what have I said? One thing I've said is the hypothetical existence and properties of the six-dimensional 2-0 theories leads to many exact results for partition functions, line and surface defect correlators, BPS spectra, et cetera. There are also several 2D, 4D correspondences and other remarkable interrelations in this area of physical mathematics that can often be traced, perhaps always be traced, to the existence of these six-dimensional theories. And these theories even push the envelope, challenging what we uh, think should be the proper definition of a quantum field theory. What are other potential applications? In physics, well, I think it's clear that there will be applications to three-dimensional quantum field theory, perhaps to three-dimensional quantum gravity. Uh, then we should study more systematically compactification on four manifolds. After all, a special case of that would be the MSW04 string, which is related to the supersymmetric black holes. And I hope that some of this technology will come back and be applied to supergravity and string compactification. What about applications to mathematics? Well, the relation to the work of Fock and Goncharov, cluster algebras, geometric Langlands, all this suggests possible deep connections to number theory. I actually wrote this long before I even knew that Anastasia Volovich would be talking at this conference, and her talk, therefore, uh, all, all amplifies very much what I'm saying here. It's the same Goncharov. Goncharov is a number theorist. Um, another possible application to mathematics is to knot homology and categorification. In fact, it's clear 
that there will be applications to not homology and categorification. The question to my mind is, will physicists beat the mathematicians? So, you know, come on, gang. What we're looking for is what the Americans call a slam dunk, OK? Um, so let me leave you with the central unanswered question. Can we construct this theory S of G? So mind the gap. And uh, that's not all, folks, not by any means, but that's all we have time for today. Thank you. Any questions for Greg? I think there's a question from Nadi back there. Oh, you bet. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> weeks. <laughs> I don't know. Greg, Actually, five minutes, because I don't know anything about it. But uh, somebody else could talk for weeks, I'm sure. Edward, yeah. Uh, I mean, this isn't much of a question, but what could we hope for as a construction of this theory? We, what would be meant by a construction? The, we aren't thinking that there are classical fields that can be quantized to get this theory. No, we're not. But there are physical quantities that we uh, would like to uh, construct. We would like to construct um, the correlation functions of the chiral operators that I did not discuss. We would like to talk about the surface defects and maybe the operator product expansion of the surface defects. We would like to have an a priori formulation of uh, how we could put this on an arbitrary six manifold. So I could ask the question, if I take a compact six manifold and take the non-abelian theory on it, um, and uh, I make sure that that uh, partition function is well defined, I think that's a question we could ask. Is ADS7 times S4 a construction? Well, I've thought about that. And um, yes, it certainly constructs some things. Of course, it's the large end limit. And um, well, it's weakly coupled for large n. Uh, yes, uh, so that that that's certainly an approach. I guess I should have I made a mistake. I should have uh, listed that in my uh, list of approaches. One problem there might be that you want to find an ADS space with an arbitrary six manifold with a four sphere bundle over it. You might need to, you might need, want to find uh, uh, M theory geometries of that nature, but indeed you can approach it. And I have even myself written papers <laughs> uh, using that approach. Yes, uh, to the singleton, for example. One over there. Yeah. Uh, that's your, that's your job, Wadi. <laughs> no, I don't know. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Greg again. Thank you.